Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I actually had the pleasure of seeing Monish speak a few years ago and uh, I, you know, followed him onto the subway and we had a short conversation on the subway after he spoke uh, at the Columbia Business School uh, Investor Conference, which is, which is always a great conference. Um, so I'm so glad that we were able to have him virtually here today. Um, and Monish founded Pabri Funds about 21 years ago, and he's, he's since expanded the firm to about half a billion dollars in, in assets under management. Um, you know, he can tell us a lot more about his story, but I think one of the most interesting things, and, and this is something that Charlie Munger actually called out at the Daily Journal meeting a few years ago, was that, you know, just like Warren, Monish does not charge asset management fees. He charges only performance fees. So, you know, he would be generating about 10 million in fees every year if he did the standard two and 20 model, but he prefers to let the performance do the, do the talking. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation as, as I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, so Monish, if, if you could maybe just, just uh, at the beginning, talk a little bit more about launching your fund. I know um, one of the student investment fund members is actually in the process of launching his own fund. So I'm sure he would benefit a lot from, from your learnings and maybe any advice you might have for someone wanting to launch a fund today? Oh, sure. Well, uh, Jamie, pleasure to be here and uh, uh, good to be virtually on the UCLA campus. So that's, uh, uh, that's great. Uh, last time I was on the, on the UCLA campus, I think uh, Royce Hall, I watched uh, Russell Peters, uh, who uh, maybe the, the, some discerning few of, new, of you from South Asia might know of. Uh, but he's a he's a, a South Asian comedian who grew up in Toronto, and uh, so if you haven't watched Russell Peters, you can go on YouTube and uh, listen to some of his uh, his stuff. But uh, anyway, great uh, great to be here and great to see you again. Uh, we're not uh, we're not as uh, time bound as our subway uh, subway journey, but that's that's okay. Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of uh, starting uh, starting a fund and such, uh, my my journey was a little bit uh, different in the sense that I I had never worked uh, in the industry. Uh, you know, I, I'm a computer engineer by, by training, and I was running an IT services firm in the late '90s. And uh, mid nineties, I heard about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger for the first time, 94, I think. And that was uh, transformational. You know, I, I really was uh, blown away with, uh, you know, reading and learning about them. And, uh, and that got me started on the journey of investing uh, my own, uh, my own money and, in, in 94, I had uh, sold uh, uh, a small portion of uh, the business and uh, after taxes, I had about a million dollars uh, with me. First time ever that I had any uh, you know, cash in the bank, so to speak. And, uh, and so I said, you know, I'll, uh, I'll take the million and invest it based on uh, Buffett Munger principles and just see kind of what I can do with it. And uh, it did really well. Uh, I mean, of course, at that time, there was a uh, raging bull market going on uh, in the mid '90s, which culminated in a mega bubble, uh, and uh, the bubble burst in in March 2000. Uh, but so I, I did really well in that period. I think uh, something like 70% a year, more than 70% a year, uh, from like '94 to '99 or so. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I thought to myself, you know, well done, Monish. Uh, uh, I knew you could do this and, uh, and such. And, uh, and at that time, I had a few friends and uh, uh, whenever I'd see them, if I had, you know, already bought a position, I would tell them about, uh, you know, some stocks they could buy and so on. And some of these guys would go and invest in things I'd tell them about. And uh, they also did really well. Um, so uh, they were, uh, they became even better friends. Uh, and, and a bunch of them actually approached me 
in early 99 and they said that they wanted me to uh, manage money for them. And, uh, and basically, you know, what, what they were saying is that some guy would have like a you know, couple of million dollar net worth and I'd tell him to uh, buy something and he would put you know, $10,000 into it and it would triple, uh, but it wouldn't really move the needle in terms of his net worth. And, and also sometimes I wouldn't see them for a while. And so they would buy stuff and then they wouldn't know what to do with it and so on. And uh, so they said, look, uh, there's each of us wants to give you like $100,000 to manage. And then you manage that money for us and we don't need to get into these stock tips and all that. And um, I, uh, I thought about it. And uh, so what I did not want to, you know, my concern was I didn't want to lose their money, uh, you know, because they were very close friends of mine. So I didn't want to have any kind of like a negative impact on the friendship or anything. And I didn't really uh, think of it as a, uh, a, a business or anything. I think of it, I thought of it as a hobby. Uh, so I said that if I'm going to manage the money, I want to do it in the format of the Buffett partnerships, uh, which, uh, you know, where Buffett had uh, these 1950s and 60s partnerships where he basically uh, did not take management fees. And uh, eventually his deal was uh, 0.625, which is a 6% annual hurdle. And then above that, he took 25% and his investors got 75%. And uh, so I told him, listen, I'd like to set up a, a, a limited partnership with these rules. And they really didn't care. They said, you do whatever you want, man, we'll, we'll give you the money. And uh, they didn't really understand what I was trying to do or, or any of that. And uh, I went to, I went to a an attorney who knew nothing about investment funds, and uh, and to and I took him some pages of Lowenstein's book. I photocopied a few pages which talked about Buffett's fee structure, and I told him, "Listen, create a limited partnership for me with these rules." And he wasn't really a, like a securities lawyer. And uh, later, I had to spend uh, a few thousand dollars fixing things that. Uh, he didn't quite do right, but we, we eventually straightened the boat out. Uh, but, uh, but the other thing I had done at that time was because I did not want to lose money for my friends, I guaranteed their principal. Uh, you know, I gave them a personal guarantee that there would be no loss of principal. And not only that, that they would make at least 6% a year. Uh, so principal was guaranteed and 6% a year was guaranteed. And then above that, it was whatever the, you know, the fund generated and so on. And, um, and so the, the, the fund got going. And, and the reason I did these guarantees, because again, like I said, I just didn't want this group to have an, any kind of negative impact. And at that time in 99, I personally was worth around 10 million because the, you know 70% a year uh, starts adding up. And uh, so I said, okay, you know, I've, I've got 10 million. There's a $1 million fund that I'm guaranteeing. It's really uh, no problem. You know, what I'm saying is this, even if things don't go well, I think I can take care of it, right? And uh, so, so the fund got going and in the first year we were up uh, 70%, which to me sounded like the magic number. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it was up like 70%, I think after fees. And that was, it was up 70%, including, so the fund launched July 99 and the first year ended like June 30th, 2000. And that included the NASDAQ, uh, you know, crashing and, you know, starting its decline. So inclusive of all that, we were still up because I had completely sidestepped the bubble. I, I mean, I knew there was a bubble and, uh, there was nothing that I was doing in our funds that was going to, uh, I mean, we had no investments in pets.com. Okay, let's put it that way. And, uh, and uh, so as the market was tanking, we were, we had very really strong performance and, uh, and more investors wanted to invest. Uh, their friends, they told their friends about this guy 
who's given them a principal guarantee and 6% a year guarantee and all these things. And so uh, other people were interested. I, and I realized that I wanted to uh, do this more formally uh, ra rather than a hobby on the side. And I had gotten rid of my IT business, which I was uh, not very interested in. And, uh, but I said, uh, if, I, if I were to scale this, uh, I, I can't have the guarantees and stuff, you know, it doesn't scale. And so I went to my partners and said, hey, uh, listen, I wanna, I wanna keep adding more investors and scaling and all that, and we need to remove the guarantees, okay? So they said, uh, we like the guarantees, you know? And uh, we really don't, uh, uh, we really don't wanna remove them. We like the guarantees, okay? So I said, I, I can't bring in more people unless, you know, there will be two different classes of investors and all that. So I said, okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this fund and shut it down. And I'm going to start another fund. And the other fund is going to be the same as this one, but there's going to be no principal guarantee. So they all said, oh, okay. And when I closed the fund, they all came to the other fund. Okay, like, like they were not willing to, you know, get rid of the guarantee, but then when they had no choice, uh, everyone was on board. And so then I felt, uh, and I also felt good because they were already up. They were already up quite a bit, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, they were sitting at significant gains. Um, so, so that's how the funds got started. And so it moved from uh, basically just, I mean, I had eight investors when we started a year later, I had 17 investors. And then maybe two years after, after I started, the, about 25 investors. And it just kept going from there. And I looked very closely at Buffett's journey uh, because Buffett also really just went to his very close friends and family initially. And then as he started delivering uh, really spectacular numbers, uh, you know, gradually the kind of base of investors expanded uh, over that. So, um, so the so Pabrai Fund started as a hobby uh, and then it got going. I, I would say that if, if someone was starting today, um, so I would say that uh, one is that if you're starting a fund and you're starting with a modest amount of capital, uh, you really don't have any expenses in the sense that you don't need office space and you don't need uh, a staff or any of those things. I mean, I, uh, I think till, uh, um, till for the first year and a half, I think I was running this out of my house, uh, the funds. And after that, I took one, uh, one room in my, my wife's business. I rented from her, I took one, one of a small office. Uh, from her and I, I, I hired a part-time assistant who was working maybe ten hours a week or something. So like you know, I, I, I had maybe four or five hundred dollars in rent, uh, maybe four hundred dollars in rent, and maybe you know a fairly small payroll. Uh, you know, the expenses were pretty, uh, pretty low. Um, and uh, and and uh, so uh, I think if someone's starting today. Uh, you do have upfront costs to set up the fund, uh, which you would need to front because there are no investors initially to set up the documents and, and all of that, uh, the legal fees. But what you can do is uh, you can amortize those expenses over let's say five years for the fund to repay you. So let's say for example, if you spent $25,000 or something, setting up all the legal documents and so on, uh, you could have the fund pay you back like five thousand a year, so it's it's spread out to the investors over a while, um, and and basically uh, the the key is that um, initially I think uh, you have to focus on friends, family, and fools, um, especially the fools, uh, and uh, and uh, and then once you get going, I think then if you uh, perform well, then that group of investors will 
probably want to give you more money to manage and probably also give you some introductions to people they know and so on. So that's what I would say is how you could uh, get going. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, and can so kind of now, as we look over the last 20, 21 years, you've obviously seen a, a, a large change in, in kind of the investing landscape and, and maybe, you know, multiples kind of contracted a lot significantly in the first couple of years you were running the fund and now they've kind of expanded and you have the financial crisis. So can you talk about how your investing philosophy has changed or, or how maybe not the philosophy, but, but where you're looking has changed in investments now versus what you were investing in 10 and 20 years ago? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So actually uh, I went through tremendous learning and growth in like 94, 95. When I first heard about Buffett and Munger, it was like kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant. Uh, you know, you, you had all the uh, Berkshire letters and uh, the partnership letters, and then some biographies that come out on, on Buffett. And so there was a lot of learning and growth for me then. And, um, and at that time, I think uh, uh, 94 or so, because I was running a uh, tech company and my background was in technology, the portfolio uh, tended to be um, a significant amount of uh, software and technology names and so on, because that's what I knew. I knew those well. Um, and, uh, and, and at that time, uh, my, my modus operandi was in many of these cases to kind of set it and forget it, uh, you know, sort of buy and hold. Uh, and, uh, and, in in uh, in some cases, uh, because the um, the growth engines were so robust, so far out, uh, I pretty much felt like when I bought these companies that um, I should never sell them. Uh, so there were two businesses at that time in the uh, in the mid '90s that I'd invested in, which became hundred baggers. Um, 100 baggers are really good for your health and your wealth. Um, and uh, one of them uh, was, a, was a company in India. I, I, I'd opened a, a brokerage account in India and I had just made very little investments in India. I, I think out of the million dollars, maybe like $20,000 uh, went, went into India. But one of the bets I made, which was about a $10,000 bet, uh, was a company called uh, Satyam Computer Services. And uh, I knew those guys well because uh, uh, they used to visit the US. Uh, I had some clients in common with them. And so I had interacted with them and I was very impressed with the way they ran their affairs. And when I looked at the business, they, was, they were trading for below the liquidation value of the real estate they owned in Hyderabad. So the market was not even valuing their business, which was growing 50% a year. I mean, it was just on a, on a rocket ship. Uh, and it was a really great business because they had a lot of recurring revenue from Fortune 500 US companies and so on. So I said, wow, this is like so far, so deep undervalued. Um, you know, I, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't know how well the repatriation laws would work in India, et cetera. So anyway, I, I made a $10,000 bet and that, eventually became about 140x. So it became like 1.4 million, which was great. And, and actually I, I had no intentions of selling it, but then in the, the year 2000, they had spun out uh, a dot-com business in 99. And that business they spun out, got some ridiculous valuation and then their own stock was being valued very highly because of that. And so my, my take was, uh, when I looked at it in 2000, I said, oh, this is just too ridiculous in terms of valuation, even though I wanted to hold it for a while. I said, this is just very extreme. So I sold it and I pretty much must have sold it within two weeks of the peak. Uh, and then it proceeded to lose about, it was still would have been a great investment, but it lost about 
60, 70% of its value after that. Uh, so we still had a huge multi-bagger, but nothing like what we captured. Then there was another business uh, at the time, uh, CMGI, uh, which was uh, based in Boston, which was spawning dot coms. So they were like an incubator uh, creating dot coms, and then all of those, some of those are going public. So it was a, I, I knew the internet would be big, and I knew that uh, some of these businesses would make it, but I didn't know which ones, and I didn't want to pay for any of these businesses. So I felt like if I bought CMGI and they keep, you know, creating these dot coms, it's kind of like the way it would be with investing in Tencent or Alibaba today. You know, they, these businesses are creating many, many businesses. And of course, the difference is, uh, well, I think in both cases, even in the case of Amazon, all these businesses throw a lot of stuff against the wall. And most things don't stick, but some things do stick. And when they stick, they stick and do really well. Um, so, so my take with CMGI was I was buying it at a pretty modest valuation in the mid nineties. And then it just went crazy over the next few years. So that actually was a hundred thousand, uh, 10% bet that became over a million and, uh, I mean, over 10 million, sorry. And, uh, so, so, so those were good times, but then, uh, when the fund started, in 99, 2000, uh, I could see the, the bubble and I could see these valuations uh, being quite crazy. Uh, so at that time, the market has split into kind of two halves. Uh, one half was this frenzied, crazy multiples and the others were these boring companies like Berkshire and so on that no one was interested in. And um, so the day the NASDAQ peaked, I think March 6th or March 9th, 2000, was the day that Berkshire hit a multi-year low. So as the NASDAQ was hitting 5,000, I think uh, Berkshire was sitting at like 40,000, uh, down from 70,000. So it had dropped quite a bit. And uh, so if you were willing to look at non-sexy businesses at that time, um, you could get them at, uh, very modest multiples, even though there was a lot of frenzy. Um, and something, I think somewhat similar now where there's a sliver of the market that is exuberant, uh, but a large portion of the market I see today is probably uh, overvalued, but maybe not egregiously overvalued. There's a small sliver, which I think is egregiously overvalued. Um, and then you've got a lot of uh, businesses, I think that people are not very interested in right now. So uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s, I changed my style uh, because I could see that, you know, markets are quite overheated. So I wanted to buy value because I could not find anything in technology or anything that made sense in terms of valuations. So my, my style of investing changed uh, from what you might call GARP to you know, buy a 50 cent dollar and sell at 90 cents. And hopefully that dollar maybe increase a little bit in size over time. So I practiced that until actually this year. And this year, I uh, year 2000, most people would like to forget, but year 2000 was a terrific year for me from a learning point of view. Uh, it It's probably the next biggest year for learning for me was the bit mid nineties. And, uh, and so the, the big epiphany for me this year was that uh, if, you, if you are lucky enough to have bought into a great compounder at a reasonable valuation um, with a long runway, uh, then you should not, you should not let it go just because it gets to a hundred cents on the dollar or 120 cents on the dollar. So I was never in the past willing to hold a business above intrinsic value or above, let's call it optical intrinsic value. Um, so uh, the, and, and Charlie Munger has talked about it, right? He says that there's no rational way to justify it, but he's not willing to sell great businesses he owns 
just because they are somewhat uh, or they appear to be somewhat overvalued. Like, uh, you know, I just I just met uh, Charlie a week ago uh, for a socially distant dinner at his patio in, in LA. And uh, at all times I was uh, at least eight or 10 feet away from him with a mask on. So, and only time I didn't have a mask on was when I was eating, but when I was eating, I was actually at a different table. So I was um, uh, always made sure I'm sufficient distance from, from Charlie. So I had to speak a little louder, which is okay. Uh, but like, for example, you know, he says that he owns Costco at 40 times earnings, right? And he won't sell Costco at 40 times earnings. He wouldn't buy it. He wouldn't buy a Costco at 40 times earnings, but he won't sell it. And he says that there's no intellectual way to justify it. You know, everything should either be a buy or a sell, right? I mean, the, at a particular price, but he says Costco is definitely not a sell for him at 40 times trailing earnings, right? So. So the big uh, lessons I learned in 2000 was don't sell a compounder just because it appears optically overvalued uh, and keep the compounder until it gets egregiously overvalued. Like it's really like you, you can't justify it. Um, I mean, I would say that uh, I, didn't, I didn't exactly get uh, this for Munger, but I would say that if Costco got to 100 times earnings, uh, I'm not sure Charlie would be holding. I mean, he has very deep love for Costco, uh, but maybe at 50 times earnings, he would hold, and maybe even at 60 times earnings, he would hold, but maybe not at 200 times earnings or 100 times earnings. So, uh, so give it some room, basically give it some room, uh, because if you've got these great businesses with great runways, uh, with great DNA, I mean, if you look at a business like Costco, they have one store in China, okay? And what does Costco's business look like in China 20 years from now, right? Um, maybe it looks like what happened in the first 20 years in the US. Maybe it might be even twice that, we don't know. Or maybe it's, it's a dud, it doesn't go anywhere, right? Uh, if they get to, 20 stores and then they say this is for whatever reason not working. So there's a wide range of outcomes, right? And, but there are certainly some outcomes in that mix where they could have a massive home run in, Ch home run in China with, you know, thousand plus stores and they could have a massive home run in 20 other countries, you know? So the number of countries Costco is in today is a really small number. Um, so, in the range of things, a lot of things are possible for Costco. Um, and so, you know, uh, give it that room to run as long as the DNA is intact, the culture is intact, uh, and the business is a lovable business still. So don't, uh, so two, two, uh, two lessons I learned. One is that I was always looking for the last 20 years for discounted pies. <coughs> and I didn't really care whether the pie, I didn't really care whether the pie grew or not. My take was that if I bought a business for 40 cents or 50 cents on the dollar, and I, I've always implicitly assumed that um, market efficiency would kick in in two or three years. So if I'm correct that a business is worth a dollar and I'm buying it for 50 cents and I sell it for 90 cents and that convergence takes place in two or three years, uh, it's a very nice rate of return in the twenties. And so you don't really need a, a compounder to do that. The negative with that is that then you've got to keep finding the next one and the next one and so on. And the second is you've got this irritating thing called taxes, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, so the, the, the better model is to uh, be able to run for a while. Now, uh, the way Monish is wired, 
he is unable to pay up for a great business. A lot of other investors are uh, wired where they are far more willing and able to pay up. But I know Monish and Monish is just not wired that way. So that is perfectly okay. So I am limited to a universe where um, a compounder is maybe not recognized as a compounder or it has hit a temporary hiccup or something where the valuation is really cheap, um, but there is a genuinely long runway and growth ahead. And instead of just getting off that train when it looks fully priced, which is what I did many times in the past, uh, this time the idea is stay on the train, stay on the train for a while and only get off the train when it gets egregious. So I think this, this is a transition uh, and I looked at, looked, at, looked, at, looked at my own portfolio in the last few years, and I really kicked myself. You know, the thing is, I used to own this Chinese liquor company called Mao Tai. And, uh, you know, Mao Tai is the most valuable liquor company on the planet. It's a north of 200 billion uh, market cap. And, um, and uh, their product, I think the cost of a bottle maybe is not more than $5 tops. And, uh, and I think the selling price is not a 150. Uh, you know, that's a really good business to be in. When your cost of goods sold is $5 and your selling price is 150. And in five years, you can take that selling price of 300. And in 10 years, you can take it to maybe 500 or whatever. And 80% um, of the Mao Tai sold in China is counterfeit. It's fake because the demand is so high. And so the company has, in, in their case, they, they cannot grow volumes very easily because uh, the sorghum that it is based on, that the soil in which it grows is only in a certain part of China. And there's only a certain amount of acreage uh, from where you can get that sorghum. And then they, they really actually draw the water only on one particular day when the moon is, there's a full moon in the autumn. And on that day, they draw the water for the whole year. So there's basically one batch uh, made in the year, if you will. So they've got, uh, but then they're blending it with like a hundred years of previous blends and all that. Anyway, it's a very unusual company. And uh, I got it uh, relatively cheap and uh, I like the business. And then in, in the next four or five years, it went up six, seven times. And it started looking optically expensive. You know, not even like Costco, just like, you know, high 20s, low 30s type of multiple. And I got off the train. And then it went on to more than double, you know, in the next couple of years and it'll keep going. And, uh, and then the same thing also happened to me with Ferrari. You know, I invested in a company called Fiat Chrysler and they spun out uh, Ferrari shares. And uh, when they spun out Ferrari shares, my thinking was the company has, with their bankers, priced it appropriately uh, because they're obviously trying to capture value. And Ferrari came public in the 40 odd dollar range uh, in, I think, 2016 or so. Um, and, uh, and I said, okay, you know, this looks like a very good business. And uh, as it started to approach 70, 80, $100 a share, and on a trailing earnings basis, it started looking expensive. Uh, I said, we've had a very nice ride. And it was a very significant portion of the portfolio because just the Ferrari portion of my portfolio was like over a hundred million. And um, so I sold and then it kept going and the earnings kept going up and it's more than doubled since then. And both Mao Tai and Ferrari were not egregiously overvalued. They were at best optically overvalued for a cheapskate like me. And in both cases, I should have just held on because these are remarkable, unusual businesses. I mean, Ferrari is one of the most recognized brand in the world. 
And in their 70 plus, his, 70 plus year history, they've never spent a dollar on advertising. You know, like GM, you know, how much does GM spend on advertising or how much does Mercedes or BMW spend on advertising or Porsche, Ferrari has spent zero. And they have the most dominant brand even amongst autos or non-autos, you know, most recognized dominant brands in the world. So anyway, incredible franchises. And I was very dumb and stupid. Um, and like Munger says, we are old too soon and wise too late. Uh, but I still feel I hopefully have maybe 25, 30, 35 years runway left. And uh, if I can apply the lessons of 2020 and, uh, not so one of the changes that I made is I'm not interested in buying discounted dollar bills. I want to look at dollar bills that are going to grow in size. The pie has to be a growing pie. And of course, I'm a cheapskate, so I want to buy the pie cheap, but I'll run it for a while. And so that's the change this year. And uh, uh, that what also what that means is that in a given year, if I can find one or two, uh, that's plenty. So that's the that's the modus operandi now. For for speaking with us, um, so so I had a question from from what I understand, you look a lot at international companies, especially in you know locations where a lot of investors don't typically look at. What is what is your approach when it comes to kind of you know, finding businesses that, you know, don't have, you know, active sell side research and, you know, other types of forms that other investors are used to looking at. Yeah, well, the, the sell side research is mostly garbage. I mean, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the thing is that uh, I remember that when I was making this investment in India, the Satyam computers, uh, the broker said to me, you know, we, we cover the name. And I was in Mumbai and he said, uh, do you want to uh, see our report on Satyam? I said, sure. So he gave me the report and uh, stock was at like 40 rupees a share. And the report was saying it's worth like 60 rupees a share. And I knew that the real estate loan was worth more than two times the stock price. And I'm not even getting to the business and the growth of the business. And the business has 50% a year growth going on for many years and the real estate is not where the value of the business is. The value of the business is in their operations, okay? So none of that is in the report, right? So then the broker says, by the way, do you wanna meet the analyst who wrote the report, okay? And I said, sure. So. I met this uh, nice lady who was the analyst who wrote the report. And I, I, I told her, listen, um, I don't want to kind of, you know, you know, go against what you're saying, but I just happen to work in this industry. I have a company in this industry. I understand this industry quite well. And I think your report kind of misses it by a mile. I think that you need to put in here a target price, which is like 600 rupees and it's sitting at 40. And she said, no, we can't do that. I said, I said, why can't you do that? She said, uh, I said, I can show you why it's worth that. She said, no, no, uh, the way it works in our business is we put like price target, no more than 30, 40% above where it is. And then when the stock goes up, we again, bump it another 20, 30% above that. And we keep going as so I'm saying, so then the report is complete garbage, okay? It's not really going into reality. And the, and the thing is, a lot of the analyst reports, they're really near term, one or two quarters ahead. They're really focused very near term. And they really don't go into what happens 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, and looking at it like you own the business, you know? We don't need precision on what's gonna happen next quarter. I don't need to know to the penny what's going to happen next quarter. That is complete garbage data. The nature of business is it doesn't go in a straight line. Uh, it's going to go up and down. And what you're really looking at, you want to like kind of look, look at the long-term trajectories and probabilities of different things. 
And uh, so, so, so first of all, the sell side stuff is only for entertainment. Um, and um, I think what I find useful is I find useful to look at things like Value Investors Club. I think that's a good place to look because there people are, you know, putting somewhat thoughtful write-ups and such. Uh, you could look at something like Sum Zero, which is has a subscription, but again, uh, these are these are people who are basically actually on on the buy side, and you know they're interested in buying these things and so on. So I think those can be good. Or actually, a lot of people send me ideas uh, and things by by email, and those also I I like to look at if if they're you know well thought through and so on. So I think I'm not trying to invest outside the U.S. Uh, other things being equal, I would prefer to invest in the U.S. Uh, governance is a lot better. Uh, usually things are in the English language. Uh, all those things kind of make it easier. Uh, but I think what if my portfolio ends up with a lot of foreign names, in general, that is because I'm not finding much value here. Uh, and I'm finding value somewhere else. So I'm somewhat agnostic about where I find value. In fact, it, it, the hurdle is higher to invest overseas because I mean, you know, I got to go meet the company and and uh, and and I got to get past all the language and culture and other issues uh, to make sure I'm really understanding uh, the nuances. Um, and I think in this environment, uh, what I've been finding is that um, I did find uh, one business to invest in in 2020 in the U.S. Uh, because of COVID. I think things, things tanked and uh, so I could do something in April. Um, actually, a little later, maybe May or so. And uh, But for the most part, uh, most recently, it's been outside the U.S. Uh, but it's okay. I mean, I think the key is, you know, that you've got to make sure the business is in your circle of competence and uh, all the other pieces are fitting well. So then it can be work, work out fine. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd be curious um, to know, I watched the podcast you did with Edelweiss Capital where you sort of discussed how people have an external map and an internal map and how that doesn't really get aligned, but how that puts you on the path to proprietary capital. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the unfortunate part of our humans is that when we are created, um, we don't come with the owner's manual. I think there was a screw up where what should have happened is after the delivery and before the placenta comes out, there should be an owner's manual coming out and uh, which says, here's who you are. And, uh, and so what happens is that um, uh, I had I'd gone to this, through, through this with a couple of uh, industrial psychologists about, it's been about 21, 22 years ago. Uh, so their theory was that between our genetic makeup and our experiences in the first five years of our life, who we are as humans is hard coded. So who you were at the age of six, for example, and who you will be at the age of 96 is going to be the exact same person. So no change from six to 60 to 96. Um, and their perspective was that most humans have no idea who they are because that owner's manual never came, it was not given to you. And what we, what we tend to do is when, as we grow up and go into this world, um, we try to conform to the world around us so that things go in a kind of reasonable, socially acceptable way. So we look at the way other humans are and the way the other humans interact and we base our own kind of approach to life based on that model, right? And so generally speaking, that type of approach is going to lead to a distortion. So for example, let's say this is your inner map, right? 
this is who you are, hard-coded at the age of five. And it might be that you're acting something like this as your outer map, like this, you're, you're misaligned. And until you are like this, so they said, if you're misaligned, this is not gonna change. This has to move, right? So your outer map has to change to align to the inner map. And if you can align the outer, your outer persona to who you actually are, then you can go very far. This was their theory. So these two guys, they named their company Conquest and they named it Conquest after Genghis Khan. So they said that, look, people think of Genghis Khan as a tyrant, okay? You know, he's going to a village with his followers, raping, pillaging, plundering, then going to the next village, rape, raping, pillaging, plundering. And that was the lifestyle, right? And, but they said that Genghis Khan was very highly effective at what he did. So he was a tyrant on the inside and he acted like a tyrant on the ice outside, complete alignment. So they said that it is not our goal to judge you or to change you because we don't think you can be changed even if we try to. So if you are a villain on the inside, you need to act like a villain on the outside and be an effective villain. Don't try to be Gandhi on the outside when you are a villain on the inside, because then you're going to have a miserable life and you will not be effective at trying to be Gandhi. You'll fail very miserably at that. So uh, what they did is they did a bunch of, uh, you know, I took a bunch of tests with them and then they did 360 interviews with my wife, uh, my employees, my friends. And if your kids are old enough, they'll talk to your kids and so on. And through all of that, they built what they said was my personality template. And they gave it to me, actually. It's a nice 20 page document. And I try to read it, reread it every year because it really describes who I am. And, uh, and it was the first time ever that I could actually read uh, and uh, most people who have asked and who have gone ahead and taken this, you know, gone and done this, um, they've had a very hard time with the report. Uh, like, like the last guy I was talking to, um, he said, um, I hated the guy I was reading about. Okay. And and it was really hard. I said, yeah, but you know, it's you. He said, yeah, but I don't wanna be that guy. I said, well, you have no choice. That is the guy you are, okay? And, uh, and, and to his credit, he was willing to embrace that. And, uh, and, and if he embraces it and then changes external behavior to align with the internal, um, then, then you can go really far. So, so like, for example, in my case, in 1999, when I was uh, doing this, uh, went through this, I, I had a business that had, uh, I think, more than 160 employees. Um, I had founded that company about eight or nine years ago. It had grown very fast. And um, I loved that business in the first four or five years. And in the last four or five years, uh, gradually uh, my, my love for that business started to decline. And to the point that in 99, when I actually did the testing with them, I did not want to go to work. And the problem was in the past, anytime I felt like I didn't like my job or something, I just resign, you know, move on there was nobody to resign to, you know, and it's me who had created this. So when I went through this testing, they said to me, we have no idea how you actually even get ready in the morning and get to work. Okay, we have no idea how you actually are able to do that because it's so far off from who, who you are. So the first thing they told me is get rid of the company. Okay, so... I said, what do you mean by get rid of the company? It's my company, right? They said, 
you can sell it, you can find somebody else to run it, whatever else, but you need to be out of there, right? And I did follow the advice and I started a CEO search and um, I was done in six months, I was out, it was phenomenal. Um, then the second thing they told me is, uh, so they said, first of all, you don't do well in team sports, okay? So there are people who would be really good in terms of inner map, in terms of being on a soccer team, right? Where in a soccer team, you have to function as a team and, you know, and now if you're the goalkeeper, you don't need to. You know, goalkeeper, you're like off on your own tangent doing your thing, but the rest of the team needs to be kind of functioning as a team to be effective. So they said, Monish, that is not you. Your map is really simple. They said, number one, you like to play mathematical games. Okay, that's your number one thing, mathematical games. Uh, but they are very specific kind of math games. They said, uh, it has to be a game that you think you can win. Okay, so you, you've looked at the game rules and whatever, and you seem to, seem, seem to think that you can win this game, that will interest you. The third is it cannot be a multiplayer game. It has to be where you are the only guy on your team, cannot be three people or a soccer team. So a uh, single player math game, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I, I was about three months away from starting for Bry Funds. I was just starting to kind of sow the seeds on it and all that. And I asked them, uh, you know, I'm gonna be starting this fund with these friends of mine as investors what do you think of this? So they looked at it, they said, this is perfect for you. This is exactly your calling. And then one of the two of them gave me a hundred thousand. It became one of the original investors. Okay, one of these two psychologists, right? And I'm telling them, you don't know me. Maybe this is a lot of money for you. You know, maybe you don't want to invest. They said, no, no, no. I cracked your brain open. I know exactly what's in there. I'm going to kick ass with this money. Here's the money, no problem. And he did really well with it. He had no problems. Uh, so, uh, so the thing was that I've enjoyed playing bridge a lot. I mean, I discovered bridge when I was 23 years old. I still play probably, you know, more than, I, I wish I could play more. I play probably four or five hours a week, but I'd be even happier if I could take it to 10 hours a week. Like Buffett is I think at about 10, 12 hours a week of bridge. Bridge is great, okay, mathematical game. Now it's with a partner, but for the most part, it's, it's a two player game, pretty close to one player, it's fine. Um, and uh, investing, it goes beyond math. You know, it's not just pure math, but um, it's a lot of, uh, you know, an analysis and whatever. It's, it's a rational kind of, you know, way of looking at things. So that works great. And, um, and so, uh, so the thing is that if you go through that type of testing, then of course, in my opinion, everyone should go through that test and get their manual because I think it's a huge advantage. But if you didn't go through the testing, you still, you still can kind of figure it out. And the way you can figure it out will be a little slower is your body actually and your mind actually tells you uh, when you really like something and when you don't like something. So like, for example, I wasn't interested in going to work, right, in the big company I had. And uh, I didn't know why, but it was, it was off my map. Uh, I, what happened is when I started the business, it was a complete mathematical game. You know, I wanted to increase sales, grow revenues to, you know, make it run, make sure the uh, profits were enough to keep growing. It was all very even though it was not a mathematical company, it was very mathematical in the way I thought about the business. And as the company started to grow, my role changed from being a doer to basically managing politics. You know, you know, few vice presidents and then managing them. And there's no mathematics in managing them. Okay, is a bunch of nonsense managing, from my point of view, a bunch of nonsense managing a bunch of people. Uh, so I'm not, you know, like for example, if I'm, if I'm the sales guy, 
I can make it all mathematical. Suspect, prospect, qualified lead, close, okay? Like every week I'd send 200 letters, I'd make two or 300 calls, I'd have so many meetings, and then I knew based on those statistics how many deals would close, right? And that's all very buttoned down and I like that. If I'm managing a sales force, now it's a whole bunch of, you know, human mumbo jumbo going on and whatever else going on and politics going on, it was just terrible. Uh, so that was not me. And there are other people who would love that, who'd be really good at that. You know, they'd be uh, really good at all those sorts of things. So, uh, so I think the alignment issues are really, and what has happened now is that Pabrai Funds has been uh, going on for 21 years. Uh, I am probably as excited about it as the first day. Uh, the numbers have become larger, but the team size hasn't changed. And in fact, I learned from them, don't get bazillion people. So that because I get a lot of uh, questions on this and people keep asking me, you know, who these guys are who can, uh, who can open everything up for them. And so the two of them split up. Uh, so they're not, they're not together anymore. Uh, but, uh, but, but one of them, uh, I'm going to give his name here and then, uh, let him be overwhelmed such as life. Uh, his name is Jack Skeen, uh, Dr. Jack Skeen, S K E E N. Uh, and his email address is J Skeen. That's J S K E E N at Skeen Leadership uh, group.com. Charge a hundred thousand dollars, does he? Because my net debt to EBITDA right now is pretty you have to pretty limited. All you have to do is give up your first mailborn and then you have your family. <laughs> so that's the way it works. Uh, actually, when I went through this, I went through this with 12 guys together, and uh, it was a package deal at that time. It was like 25,000 for all of us together, the best 2,000 I ever spent. And I think now it's maybe around 10,000 a person. So a small fraction of what UCLA charges you. And maybe uh, the, the payoff is a lot larger. So definitely worth doing, but it's not, I would say that uh, you also have to have some fortitude uh, because you know, I'll tell you like the language will be like, it'll start like this, this narcissistic self-centered man, okay? He's not talking about Trump, okay? He's talking about, okay? So that's how it starts. This narcissistic self-centered man, blah, 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 blah. You read it and say, I can't handle this, okay? Learn to handle it, okay? So like, remember that movie, The Few Good Men? You can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson, make sure you can handle the truth, okay? Make sure there's intestinal fortitude. I just want to say I've been told that by my family, friends, and uh, ex people I've been in relationships with. So it won't be a surprise. They're all wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> thank Monish. Thank thank you so much for your time. I know everyone here really appreciates it, and and we really value value this. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Jamie. It was a lot of fun and some great questions, and uh, uh, look forward to it. And uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to. Uh, Another session sometime with you guys. Yeah.